conversation, put a lot of time into it over the years. So um, I'm going to very, very soon, after introductions, call John McWilliams up here to introduce the program. But for right now, let's do the self-introductions, um, monetary comments to uh, two sentences or less, negative comments. You know, what the heck, it's your best judgment. Forrest, you want to get us going? Uh, Forrest South, for member from Beaverton. Bill Foster, forum member, Beaverton. Ken White, Ken White, Ken, uh, Beaverton, forum member. Diane White Camp, wife of a member. <laughs> Ernie Foster, forum member, Beaverton. Maureen Long, forum member and unincorporated Washington County. Yes. <laughs> Patrick Wheeler, Beaverton. I'm Emily Neff. I'm an attorney in Hillsborough. Al Falcone, Aloha, forum member. Lee Coleman, Reedville. Ted Wells, forum member, Beaverton. Allison Welch, daughter of a forum member, and currently Iowa City, Iowa. Ben, Rock Creek resident, and I just wanted to remind you for just a second, the Portland Vintage Trolley Lives Again will be running on the Transit Mall downtown on 5th and 6th Avenues on the 1st of July, which is a Sunday, and I'm working on it, so come on down and get a free ride. Steve Weiss, Beaverton. Wayne Potter, Tiger. Julie Miner, visiting in on Hillsborough. Laura Sean, it's my first time here. My office is right next door over there, so it was an easy uh, walk over. Yeah. Wynn Wakala, our member, Bull Mountain Unincorporated. Yes! <laughs> Kristen Marshall, non member, um, Portland. Angel Larson, I am a guest. John Blackman, Southeast West Haven. Four members since the earth started to cool. Marilyn <laughs> McWilliams from Cedar Hill. Now in Mike's Edwards, they say it's a Hillsboro, but I think it's the low <laughs> in uh, Rosemont retirement. And thanks to Marilyn for being able to get here too. So. I'm Randy Archer. I'm Pastor at Village Baptist. I'm Chris Harker, I'm a state representative from House District 34, which is Beaverton, Mount Incorporated, Washington County, and Cedar Hills. Don Dunbar, former member, Cedar Hills. We appreciate you. Chris Leslie, former member, uh, Rock Creek, and for our guests, I have visitor registration cards. If you would like to get on our email list, Please see me after the meeting, or I could hand them out now. Kathy Stanton, foreign member, Incorporated Beaver. <laughs> I'm Vince Stegoch. I am a past president and will soon be a past past president after next week. Just to meet Barry, Unincorporated Beaverton, and Aloha. Bill Nelson, member Bethany. Gary Olson, and Incorporated Garden Home. Eric Squires, uh, Cooper Mountain. Carol Beauchamp, Hillsboro. Brad Bunnell, forum member of Cedar Mill. Sally Bunnell, forum member of Cedar Mill. And John McWilliams, uh, Cedar Hills. I just saw Ted Colori come in here, so Ted's here. Let me get, get a chance. Um, I'm going to use this just for a second. The rules of the forum that basically the speakers are going to speak within a lot of time period. John McWeems is going to introduce them. Only forum members can ask the questions. Identify yourself as a forum member and give your name. This is being recorded, so it, some level of posterity will be involved, so it's going to be somewhat accurate. In any event, um, I'm pleased to see everybody here, especially some of the new folks showing up here. So. John, why don't you take it away and uh, introduce everyone and get things rolling. Thanks. 
Thanks very much, John. Appreciate it. So, uh, hello and welcome to the Washington County Public Affairs Forum. Today we have two speakers that are going to talk to us on a very interesting subject. I'm going to let them talk a little bit more to tell you all about it. Our first speaker is Esther Nelson. She's the program manager for Commercial Exploitation Unit at the Sexual Assault Resource Center located right here in Beaverton. Our second speaker second speaker will be Beaverton Police Detective Chad Ovitz. He is assigned to the FBI Innocent Lost Tax Force and he'll tell us about uh, his work in the Beaverton area. So um, right now let's hear from Esther Nelson. Esther? Child welfare calls on the child welfare hotline. 
will respond even to schools, like if a school counselor were to see something that they thought was a little concerning and they thought that this might be an exploited child, we would respond to a school and we'll also respond to emergency rooms when people are brought in to receive medical attention. So we'll respond to a number of different locations in this community 24 hours a day. We have a hotline that operates 24-7, and when calls come in, we respond to those calls here in the Beaverton area as well as anywhere in those four counties. And we just offer emotional support. So we come in as advocates. We're not therapists, although we do offer mental health therapy on-site in our Beaverton location. We just go out and offer emotional support and want to encourage people to feel safe when they're interacting with law enforcement, to feel like they have rights, and to feel like they have options. And so many of them are very controlled by their traffickers and pimps that they don't often experience a lot of options in their life, and so we want to come in and really support them and encourage them and let them know that they have options. And what we find is that by offering them emotional support, the criminal justice process is less scary, and as they are less afraid, then they oftentimes feel like they can share more and stay really engaged in the process. And we hope that they stick with it so that there can be prosecution and their traffickers can be put away. That's our hope. So that process can, you know, it can range a couple weeks in a really quick-moving case to a couple years, sometimes even longer than that. And so we work with people in an intensive community-based case management model, if you will. So we're out in the communities. They don't have to be in care. They could even be still literally on the run, living in a motel with their pimp, and we'd still be offering services to them. So we'll be out in the community meeting with them and safety planning with them and encouraging them, and we hope that that's enough to keep them engaged in the system and engaged in the criminal justice process. And sometimes, like I said, that can take years. So we'll work with a person from the very first day on the call-out all the way through the end of their case, going through trial and hopefully seeing them, you know, find safe housing and really move on their way through life. So it's not a situation where they have to pay for it. It's all free. And like I said, it's confidential, and so anything that they share with us, we don't have to share back to the system. It's just kind of like a safe place, an ally for them in the community to offer them support. So that's pretty much what SARC offers. Locally here in Beaverton, so we have our 24-hour hotline. We do emergency response to those safe sites that I spoke of. We do free mental health counseling, both individual and group therapy, intensive case management, and then what we call pretrial prep and court accompaniment. So we go with people actually to court, to grand jury, and then through trial if their case actually goes to trial. So we offer all those things here locally, and they're totally free. We do see youth exploited in many different venues locally, and so even if, let's say, a youth was exploited in a motel or on a track, like a street on a local area or on the Internet, it doesn't really matter what venue they've been exploited in. We would take any of those survivors. We don't really have a criteria that would exclude them from services. As long as they're under the age of 18 and they've been commercially exploited, we would take them onto our caseload if they were interested in services. And we would be open to any referrals that you might maybe have them come across your path or know someone who has a child in their life that this might be an issue for. We would totally be open to their referrals, and the process would be totally free for them. Last but not least, I wanted to speak a little bit about our role as a multidisciplinary team partner to other professionals in this community. We work very closely with law enforcement, so I'm excited that Detective Chet Opitz is here today. We work closely with law enforcement both locally and federally, so Beaverton would be a local agency involved in this fight, as well as the FBI. They are very much involved in this fight. We also work with schools. Like I said, Child Welfare, Department of Human Services, they have been very involved in this fight as well, and we work closely with them. We also work with the Homeless Youth Continuum. Homeless Youth Services provide residence for youth who are picked up on the street. They provide emergency housing and long-term housing. And we work with community-based mental health as well, so county-based mental health in all four counties. And we wrap our services around the youth no matter where they're located. In fact, sometimes we even move youth outside of the state for safety reasons, and our services will still move with them to help keep them safe. So as a partner to those other community-based services, I would say that I'm very thankful for the rest of them. We certainly couldn't do it on our own. It's an overwhelming issue, and there's an overwhelming need here locally, and so I'm just really thankful to be able to work with other professionals that are so great at their job. 
So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Detective Chad Owens. Just to, to show 
show you that it's just not a Portland problem, it's just not a Las Vegas problem, it's not a, um, an LA problem. Um, we have many of our runaways, many girls that uh, will run away from Beaverton or just some of our Beaverton girls just um, with their parents not knowing, meet up with um, men out in North and Northeast Portland. Lloyd Center's real popular, Clackamas Town Center, real popular. They're older men um, in their 20s, and right away these guys will say, hey, you know, I'll buy you something, I'll buy you um, a pair of shoes, I'll buy you a watch. We'll even just, hey, why don't we go on a trip, let's go to Seattle, you ever want to go to Seattle? And if, if they're runaways, they're, these girls, yes, you know, I want to go live that life. And then they'll get up, uh, get up into uh, Seattle or down to uh, Los Angeles or Las Vegas, and these pimps, tell them, well, we need to stay at the hotel room. Um, you need to go make us the money to uh, to go stay at the hotel. And these girls are, I don't know what you're talking about. And these these girls are either get beat or um, by then maybe these guys have taken pornographic pictures of these girls and they'll threaten to send them to mom and, or put them on Facebook and say, well, if you don't go out and earn that money, um, we're going to send out, I'm going to send out all these photos on the internet.
we cannot protect her, and we cannot, we're not set up law enforcement-wise to provide 24-7 protection of somebody. We just can't. That's why we have programs like SARC and other places, and we can try to get them in shelters and get them into programs and whatnot to keep them safe, but ultimately it's a decision they're going to have to make and to get out of that. So in working, and just to tell you a little bit about the task force, the advantage about working with the task force is that I can decide if I want to charge somebody through the state, which it's a lot easier to charge somebody through the state of Oregon or through federally, through the federal system. We're going to get prison sentences are a lot longer in the federal system. It's just they're just more selective on their cases through that. But it's really good case-wise if we get a pimp that takes a minor over the state lines. So even in Vancouver to Portland, if there's a pimp that takes one of our minors from Portland to a date in Vancouver for the purposes of sex trafficking, that's interstate travel, and that means they go away for a very long time. So I suggest, well, my job, I just do my best to track the girls, go after the pimps, and once we find those girls, my main thing is keeping them safe and getting them out of the game and not, and to make sure these pimps don't do it to somebody else. That's my job in a nutshell. So thank you very much, Chad, and thank you, Esther. We do have some questions, I'm sure, so we have microphones on both sides of the room, and so please come and ask your questions, and we'll just alternate. Sure. You know me, I'll ask right away. Good morning, Your Honors. May it
she got into this and what has happened to her. I know the average life of someone who gets into this is only seven years. I'm not going to give an actual detailed story of any one person. I don't think that I have the clearance to do that. I don't think that would be a safe idea. However, I do think the idea of telling a general thematic story might be helpful. Sure. So, unfortunately, there is sort of almost like a cookie-cutter theme to many of the experiences of the youth that we work with. Most of them, not all of them, but most of them have come from some sort of traumatic childhood. So many of them are already involved in the foster system or are running away from home because home is not safe. Like I said, not all the time. They certainly could come from any background, any socioeconomic status, and have a fabulous home life. But, unfortunately, there's a large over-representation of foster youth and at-risk youth that are being exploited. So for a youth who's already had a hard time at home and who may be struggling at school and looking for friendship and acceptance, and let's face it, all youth are, it's a prime opportunity, I guess I should say, for a pimp or a trafficker to kind of swoop in and get to know them. They usually represent themselves as a potential boyfriend. If not a boyfriend, they'll do, let's see, I'm a rapper and I can get you a contract. I work at a radio station and you could be a DJ. Or another one that's really common is I do photography and you could be a model. So those are really common themes, but the most common theme is I could be your boyfriend. And like I said, that's really, I think, something that most youth are looking for at some point in their adolescence. So, you know, they're very vulnerable to that. So once they meet this person, but from the pimp's perspective, the whole goal is to kind of suck them into this isolated environment, this isolated relationship, and then what we call the breaking stage, well, they'll push them out into the sex industry. So there's the recruitment stage, which looks like usually a courtship. Then there's the breaking stage, which is usually violent, where they're pushed into the industry. It's very manipulative. And then there's just the maintenance stage, where they're kept there through threats of violence and violence. Wynn mentioned that the average age life expectancy of someone involved in the industry is about seven years, and that is accurate. It's an economy that's driven by demand, and so the demand is for vulnerability. The demand is for youth. And so youth garner a higher price in the industry than adult women. And as they get older, they have less bargaining power, if you will, and things become more violent for them, and they're more and more marginalized. And so we see them hitting about 22, 23, maybe 25 max, and they start to lose a lot of relative power. They never have power, but they lose a lot of bargaining power in the sex industry with buyers. And then we know that if they stay in the industry, the average age of death is 34. So by the time they're really an adult woman, they can no longer represent themselves as a child. Then if they have to stay in the industry because they don't have other options, then they usually end up dead. So it's really not – it's a very bleak outcome for them. And they start out usually very marginalized. They are re-exploited at many points along the way. And I think that this sounds like a very hopeless story, but I guess I would say there are a lot of opportunities for intervention. They're all known to the system, almost all of them. Very rarely are they some kid who completely fell through the cracks that we don't know anything about. They're usually mislabeled, though, as delinquent, disrupted in class, they get expelled from school, problem children, even worse terms like promiscuous children, which to me is a complete misnomer. But anyway, I digress. So they are known to the system, and I think that we have a lot of opportunities to see them for what's really going on as survivalists and kind of reframe their behavior and look one step further as to what's going on in their life and then just be safe adults that are not judging them, that are willing to participate in their life, even if they're hard to deal with, which they have been labeled that way because they're going through a lot. But I think we have a lot of opportunity to step in.
first thing I would say is we look towards statistics for people getting out of violent relationships. We know that with domestic violence, an adult woman who has access to adult services, has really a sense of agency of themselves, and a lot of adult development in their brain, like a lot of good things going for them. We see adult women in DV cycle approximately 9 to 13 times of attempting to leave a violent relationship, and that's a relationship with one person who's violent to them before they ever exit, if they do exit without being murdered. And so we're talking about little children who have been, you know, abused their whole life. They may not even have a concept of safety. They may not have access to resources. They have a different sense of agency, having been kind of under parental guidance their whole life. Brain development is not fully formed. I mean, there's all these things going on for them, and we want to see them cycle away from this adult person who's very controlling of them and then somehow leave the lifestyle or the game. And so, first of all, we know that the approximate number of times they would need to cycle, I'm assuming, would be more than 9 to 13 times because they're children. And then you add the fact that it's not one person that they're trying to leave. Sometimes it is, but many of the pimps and traffickers are gang members, like Chad said, and so they're leaving a whole, they're not just leaving one person, they're leaving a whole organization or community of people who would enact the same type of violence against them as this one person would. So knowing that it's going to take likely many more than 9 to 13 times to try to leave, that could take years. And so our services have only, this is going to be an inadequate answer to your question, but our services have only been around for four to five years, and I think that we're going to need to watch kids and be hopeful, remain hopeful for kids a lot longer than that to really see them start to leave the life. As we've been around for longer and longer, we see more and more kids leave, but it's taken this many years to see practically any kids leave. We've had kids leave right away, like we have an intervention and boom, they're done. They just needed help right then and they're out. But for the most part, we have to work with them for years to get them really extracted from the industry and to believe in themselves enough to hope for something different. So that's my idea of success. I don't have a lot of good numbers for you. I don't have any positive numbers either. I will just going to say kind of to, on these types of cases, if you, if you look at success rate of, you know, I find a victim and Beaverton Police Department works with her and SARC works with her, and if we go off the numbers of cases where we run into girls and we attempt to save them and prevent them from going back into the game, 
is, I feel great when I say one girl out of ten. I don't, I don't know how Esther feels. I, to me, I feel, I'm on cloud nine. I go home and I say, you know what? You know, I don't talk about and I don't dwell about the nine. nine, nine. It's unfortunate. I can't lose sleep over it. I want to save everybody, but I know I can't. Squire's forum member. Uh, this question is for you, Chad. Uh, Oregon is very liberal in terms of its uh, freedom of the press, free speech, and so vehicles for um, this crime are like Craigslist, Backpage. I'm curious if you have any legislative remedies or if you'd like to see tighter enforcement or if uh, control of the media would assist in uh, prosecution and control of this crime. Uh, don't get me started on the, on the, on the lovely Republic of Oregon that we have. Um, it's, uh, we, you need to be careful. Um, <laughs> we, we like our freedom of speech and we like our freedom of press and, and I agree with all that. Um, do, do I wish I could sit and say, you know what, um, back page, you shouldn't be allowed to have escort um, advertisement on your website. I wish I could. I know I won't be able to because that, because for the ones that are 18 and over and they're not doing prostitution, they're providing a escort company, you know, that much, and they'll, they, they, if you want to look at the ads, go look at the ads. It's not a crime to do it. Um, a lot of them will say, the money that exchanged in this is for my time and my time only. So, what sense does it make for me to pay a girl $250 for an hour of sitting there and, and having a talk? I can go find somebody in the park and sit and have somebody talk. And, and so that, that's how, just how, how stupid it sounds. Um, or I'm going to dance for I'm going to dance for an hour. You, you tell me, you give me, you have to have very endurance, uh, high endurance for, to uh, to boogie and dance for for an hour straight. If I'm going to be paying you $250 all they're doing is, is dancing. Um, and they never have music with them. That's the funny thing. Is, what are we going to dance to? Well, I don't know. Well, so, um, so, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but well, I, there, I don't get wrapped up in the legis this legislative part of it because there's not much I can change. I, I take it for what it is. I work with what I have. Um, you know, I'll push, I'll push the envelope as far as I can push it. Um, with these cases, and that's why we have courts. If, if stuff, you know, I won't violate people's rights. I won't do anything illegal. I won't do anything to hurt anybody. But I'll push the envelope, and that's why we have courts. If it gets thrown out, suppressed, it gets suppressed. But I'm not, I'm not going to lay down and and, uh, and and I'm going to do everything I can to, to, to make sure that these these guys don't victimize our girls.
out if it weren't for our volunteers, and so I would say that in their support of them. But we are funded through federal, state, and local grants, and so we take private donations, but we also take federal ballot funding from the Violence Against Women Act, VOCA funding from the Victims of Crime Act, so big federal acts that have supported basically efforts to combat violence against children and women, pay for our SARC services. I'm by the hour, I don't know if that's what I meant by salary, but, and I, Beaverton was very gracious on, because I'm counted as a, I don't want to say Beaverton, I mean the police department, I'm counted as a body in our detective division, which, you know, just like any other business you have, you have, you know, budgeted people for spots and allotments and whatnot, and they were very gracious because I'm removed from the detective division at Beaverton, and I'm loaned to the FBI for 18 months to just work these cases, so there are burglary cases and theft cases and whatnot that, you know, other detectives that get to pick up and work, and they're, you know, I haven't heard any at least any complaints to my face, but that's probably behind my back, but the reason I say that is at the end of the 18 months, I may have to go back to Beaverton, and I may not get to work these cases, and right now I'm the only full-time non-FBI person working out of the FBI office. We have other agencies, Tiger, Vancouver PD, Portland Police, that have part-time task force people, and, but their agencies can't afford to devote somebody full-time, so that's something that, since a lot of you are from Beaverton, you know, yeah, I'll, anything you can send to our administrator as far as, I think Chet's going to be down there forever, and you wouldn't hurt my feelings, so, because I really enjoy doing it. It's not something, this isn't a position that you work that you say, man, this is just terrible, I hate going to work every day, because some people I know wouldn't want to work, that's what I'm doing, but I enjoy doing it, and I hope they keep me down there as long as I can. I wouldn't want to let you in, I'm a volunteer with the organizations I've been running, but I wanted to let you know, if you don't think it happens here, I heard about, through, I used to teach water aerobics, and one of my class people told me about a girl who just over at 185th, the, what do you call it, Albertsons, just down the street. Just real quick, I'd like to hear everybody through before people repeat. Okay, anyway. So if you could summarize this within three words, you're on. Anyway, she was meeting guys there, having sex with them, and then taking the maps. Actually, three words, what's your question? Oh, anyway, she took them on the maps to the Lloyd Center to turn the money over to her pimp. But I just wanted to say on misogyny. Wait a minute, this is not a forum for you personally to speak, this is for you to form a question you have to answer to, because other people are here, so form your question and ask it. Anyway, did you know, I'm having a human trafficking series, I'm in my fourth year at Kells on June 21st, Ron Clark is going to come talk about misogyny. Do you want to talk a little bit about misogyny and how that relates to the demand side? Other than just to say that it relates to the demand side, that's probably all I can say. I think that this is a demand-driven issue, and so I think however we can unpackage what drives demand, and why demand is so focused on children and vulnerability factors, I think that is an important thing we need to consider, but that's all I would say. My name is Bill Kroger, I'm a forum member. I have two very quick questions. First one is, I was wondering in your cases, have you ever run across any where the victim is a young boy or a young man? Second one is that these people who become pimps are definitely sick in the head. I was wondering if you had a profile of who becomes pimps, where they come from, this whole thing for people that do that sort of thing. I'll address more of the second question and touch a little bit on the first one. Esther may have seen more cases on the boy victims, being males. I haven't had a case yet. We know they're out there. I believe that the boy cases, 
is are more of your, not your internet, but more of your, as far as we call it, walking the track or on the street, maybe on the, you know, more toward the East Coast or whatnot, maybe happening, maybe happening here in downtown. Again, I haven't had exposure to one of those cases yet. The second part, who becomes a pimp, it, it's, you'd be surprised, I won't name like the last names of the families, of the pimp families, because just, I don't want to put it out there, but it, you'd be surprised how much it runs in the family. And when I say family, it could be, you know, from an uncle to a nephew or to, it's, or, you know, a brother, a father, a son, even grandfathers that I know that are still, that are still in the pimping business. And it's, you know them by their last names. And you'd be surprised on talking to these girls, you know, who you're working for, who you hang around with. If they don't want to talk about the pimp, it's okay, who are your friends? And they'll name somebody and it's, it's that, it's that family. And so a lot of, as far as that, because that's, they're around it growing up. And so that's all they know. Kind of like why the, why are the girls in, when they get involved in the game when they're 14 or 15, why do they stay in it when they're 19, 20? Because that's all they know. And that's, unfortunately, I'm not saying it's right, because these pimps know better. Once they reach a certain age, they definitely know better. And the law will remind them of that. But it's also ones just physically or mentally the ones that just like to be controlling, like to, to maybe think that women are obviously inferior. And a lot of things can trigger just as far as how they see that when they were, when they were raised, how their mom was treated, how their dad, their dad was even around. A lot of them don't, sometimes their dads aren't involved in their lives. Or they'll reconnect, reconnect with them later in their life and they're in the pimping business and then they get involved with that. So. Hi, I'm Chris Harker. I'm a former member of the state rep for District 34, which is just east of here. And first of all, I want to thank you both for all the work you're doing and for bringing this pretty sobering conversation to us. It stirs up a lot of emotions. But my office has been considering introducing legislation, sort of safe harbor legislation. You touched on the difference between sex trafficking and prostitution. And some states have these laws in place. I wonder, this basically would grant immunity from prosecution to boys and girls incorporated into the situation you've been describing if they're below a certain age. I wonder from your perspective on the streets, in the rooms with these folks, would that help? I'll go first. Although I would say I want to make sure there's a balanced representation here. So feel free to jump in and chat. I would like to see the wording in the Safe Harbor Act because my initial thought is always absolutely yes. If we're really just talking about that act and no other acts that are just kind of going on peripherally in the lifestyle, I don't understand how you can call a child a sex trafficking victim and simultaneously charge them with a related crime. It's sort of like saying the rape victim is also the perpetrator of the rape. To me, it's the same mentality. And so I think that absolutely it's a no-brainer. But I also think it's a more nuanced conversation than that because if we're sending law enforcement out with no other net, if you will, to pull kids in when they see them and they think that they're a concern for their safety and we lose our net, then what do we do? And so I think it's a great conversation. I think it's without having seen the wording. I generally think it's a great law. But I think with it then needs to come a simultaneous responsibility to have a conversation about what's the new net. Like do we have like a child endangerment clause now or something that allows us to pull them in? Because without that, then we've just lost any ability to pull them in. Okay. We're losing our time. We've got time for a short 30-second question. If we can get a short, concise answer. Answer. Do you guys have immunity if the girls are talking to you? 
No. The way that this Oregon State defines confidentiality for any sexual assault or domestic violence advocate, no, we don't have immunity. And for us, hooking up and as far as arresting juveniles, we try to clear that as far as arresting them for prostitution. But we use that as leverage to getting them into the programs because if they think they're going to have prostitution on their record, they want to do everything they can in the world to not have that on the record, getting them into the services. That's how we kind of do that. Thank you. Our speakers here, you asked to remain questions. We're trying to fit this into a slot. And we're trying to, the rules are one person, one question, not two sub-questions. The only reason we're trying to do this is fairness to the forum as a whole. The forum was set up as an idea center for the county to elicit information rather than state opinion, et cetera. So I'm going to be strict, I think, in the next years on that, and we'll see. Again, this is the Washington County Public Affairs Forum. We welcome your attendance, and we're going to try to get more people out here. We see some new folks here, and I appreciate that. And everyone should take my guidance as being in the good of the order. So I'm going to open it now. The television is probably going to turn off within a few moments. But anyone who wants to ask questions is welcome to remain, and you guys at your discretion can remain too. Again, I thank you for coming. Thank you, sir. The mics are here. They're ready, and these folks are ready to answer questions. Thank you. Well, good. I do have a question. And you talked earlier, you talked about places on the east side for your Lloyd Center, Blackman Town Center. You didn't mention west side places like Washington Square, Cedarhill's Crossing, maybe downtown at Pioneer Place. And I would think that those would all be places. Actually, you have to be consistent. But are you just focusing on those east side places or everywhere? I would – he was asking about places on the west side. We just mentioned the east side. That's primarily where we see. But anywhere – these guys would go anywhere that teen girls like to go. So Washington Square, yes. Just a majority of the pimps live northeast Portland out on the east side. So it's more convenient for them just to head on down to Lloyd Center, Holiday Park area and whatnot, and hang out down there. But, yeah, anywhere that there's teen girls, light rail systems, yeah. Sounds like statutory rape to me by the customer. Is there any effort made to lean on the customer and put them away to do some hard time rather than just a money fine? Well, we're talking about the state of Oregon, so I'm more or less to spend much time in prison. Camera's off, correct? All right. But to me, you more or less than – in Oregon, you more or less have to really, really do something very bad to spend a significant time in prison. I'm not saying that having sex with a minor isn't bad, but if a 25-year-old guy is having sex with a 16-year-old girl, he's not going to prison. He'll go to jail for a little bit and may be registered as a sex offender. And that's nothing that – that's not my fault. It's not Esther's fault. That's just – that's the state of Oregon. And, you know, a lot of it's funding for jails because, you know, if we did that, you know, our jails would be overcrowded and our taxes and people don't want to understand, don't want to pay taxes, they don't want to pay – so it all comes to that. They want – you know, they want these people to go away, but they don't want to pay for it. And I'm not saying that I want to pay for it either. I want these people to go away, so it just – I agree that the Johns should be – and when 
uploaded them on the web too. Man, I got no time to sleep, man. I got me nine jobs. I do this and I do that. And I got me nine jobs, man. And, uh...